Welcome to Law Technology Now. I'm Ralph Baxter, and I'll be your co-host today. This is my third episode uh, of the show. Our guest today is the world-renowned advisor, author, and speaker on technology and the law, Richard Suskind. And appropriately, we're recording this episode in London. Before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor. Thank you to our sponsor, Headnote, helping law firms get paid 70% faster with their compliant e-payments and accounts receivable automation platform. Learn how to get paid quicker and more efficiently at headnote.com. So I've known Richard Suskind for at least 20 years. He is, without a doubt, the world's leading voice for the modernization of legal service, particularly changes that are enabled by technology. In addition to his law degree, Richard has a PhD from Oxford in computers and law, and I think that's material to uh, having a confidence in Richard's recommendations about law and technology. Richard has served as the technology advisor for the Lord Chief Justice for England and Wales since 1998. And he was recognized for his public service by being appointed to the Order of the British Empire uh, several years ago. And quite relevant to this podcast, he has a new book, which uh, we will discuss, Online Courts and the Future of Justice. Before we get into the book, I'd like to ask Richard a couple of questions that will help our listeners uh, understand him uh, better as a, uh, as a person. So first, Richard, how did it come to be that you focused on this intersection of law and technology? Thank you, Ralph, and it's great to be on your show. The history of all of this goes back to 1981. You have to imagine IBM had just invented the personal computer. I was a law student in Glasgow, Scotland, and it occurred to me then that much of what lawyers did was extremely document and information intensive. And I wondered whether or not this emerging phenomenon, the computer, might have some impact. And so I had the opportunity as a law student to write a dissertation and on a chosen subject. And I chose computers and the judicial process. That led me to the field of artificial intelligence. And I discovered at that stage there were only 26 things written in the English language, in the field of AI and law in the early 80s. And I felt this would be a good area for further research. So as you mentioned, I then went to Oxford to do a PhD on, more specifically, the use of artificial intelligence and law. Well, it's paid off, uh, and it's been a benefit to all of us. So since at least 1996, with uh, your book, The Future of Law, uh, you have been um, the most outspoken voice for the coming profound change in the way legal service is delivered. Uh, in fact, you've become kind of a shorthand for this subject. You know, as the Richard Suskins say, uh, people refer. So looking back now, as we are here in, in uh, 2019, what report card would you give yourselves on those predictions? I'm always a little bit cautious about marking my own homework. But in 1996, in that book, The Future of Law, I essentially made a 20-year prediction about transformations we might see in the way that law is practiced and the way that justice is administered in the courts. I think, roughly speaking, I got the direction of travel right uh, probably five years out. I reckon my predictions in a couple of years, most of them will have come to be the case. But some of them, in retrospect, look rather, frankly, prosaic. For example, in the mid-90s, I was making a big thing of email saying that the dominant way that lawyers and clients would communicate in the future would be by email. The Law Society of England and Wales responded that I shouldn't be allowed to speak in public and I was bringing the legal profession into disrepute. I was also anticipating in the mid-90s the wider use of the web. I said the web would become the first port of call for lawyers and judges undertaking legal research. Lawyers and judges in turn said that I didn't understand the practical and indeed the cultural significance of the law library. And I say this because we shouldn't forget how far we've come in two decades. Some technologies that now seem remarkably straightforward are now mainstream. And so when I talk about more advanced technologies, I say, for example, of online courts, they're way more likely today than email was in 1996. You couldn't be more right about 
keeping this all in context, it's pretty common for people to think, well, we're really not making all that much progress. It's also quite common for people to think that dramatic change is just around the corner, neither of which is right. Uh, We are at an early stage of what will be profound change, but it's still early, but it's moving right along. And, And as you point out, some things that now seem commonplace seemed like science fiction not too long ago. I think that's right. I think we should distinguish between automation, though, and transformation. The first 40 years of legal technology have been largely about grafting technology onto the traditional way we work. The difference we're going to see in the 20s is where the technology, in a dominant way, will come to replace rather than augment a lot of our old traditional legal practices. This is one of the fundamental points that Richard makes about the way technology and humans will work together in the future. The technology will in some cases do the work humans previously had done, and when it does it, it won't do it in the same model in the same way as the humans did it. It won't imitate the humans. It will find its way, which, if we play our cards right, will be better. So let me, one third personal idea about you. You have um, three adult children, all of whom, interestingly, are focused on technology in one way or another, but in very different settings than, than you. And you have one grandchild, Rosa. And you dedicated this new book we're about to talk about to Rosa. Why did you do that? First of all, I love the little girl like nothing on earth. But secondly, it did allow me to have a, by way of thought experiment, an interesting introduction to the book, I think, where I speculate what Rosa might think in 20 years' time when she picks up this book and she sees my handwritten dedication as well as the printed dedication And I speculate that she'll wonder why on earth her grandfather wasted so much time spending 350 pages arguing for the glaringly obvious, which is that at least some of our work of our court should be conducted online. (laughs) Obviously, Rosa is young. Rosa is about one year old. And so in 20 years time, she'll be 21. So this is, uh, this new book is my favorite of Richard's many books, and I've liked them all. I think it's remarkable. It's thought provoking. But in particular, it's focused on a particular objective, uh, the creation of online courts in ways we're about to talk about. And also in particular, it delves into the fundamental issues that we all talk about, we all take for granted as though we know what they mean, access to justice, the rule of law, justice itself, uh, in a way that helps the reader think more fundamentally about what we're trying to do here. Because if, if we do that, if we think about what are we really trying to achieve, then we can do a better job of making the changes we're in the midst of making. Uh, and so, so to me, that's, that's a, a big part of why this book is so valuable. I encourage everybody who reads it to really pay attention to the first third of the book, which deals with those subjects. So let's start with a simple question. This is an online courts and the future of justice. So what is an online court? I have my own definition that hopefully is helpful. I think of two generations of online court. The first generation itself has two aspects. One is what I call online judging. And that's the idea that you will have human judges making decisions on the basis of evidence and arguments submitted to them electronically. No oral hearings, no physical get-togethers, I ask the question, is court a service or a place? Do we really need physically to congregate to resolve our differences? And having trained and spoken to many judges over the years, it is absolutely clear that at least some cases can effectively, efficiently, and justly be disposed of by judges receiving arguments and evidence in electronic form. You can imagine it as simple as an email and responding with their binding decisions in a similar form. So that's the crude idea of online judging. The second aspect is what I call the extended court. And in some ways that's more radical. I really ask here the question in a digital society, whether or not we might make our courts more useful, extend them beyond providing binding decisions by human judges. And I link this to the problem we have everywhere of diminishing legal aid, the problem we have everywhere that people cannot really understand their entitlements without expert guidance. And so I suggest that a legitimate, indeed appropriate and useful way that our courts in the future could work is by offering online guidance, helping 
participants, court users, to understand their rights or entitlements, helping them understand the options available to them, helping them prepare the arguments and evidence, also providing opportunities to resolve their differences using alternative methods, not as an alternative to the court system, but as part of the court system. So it's now possible in a digital world to offer an additional layer of help to court users in a way that simply wasn't even conceivable before the development of the World Wide Web. So online judging on the one hand, the extended courts on the other, and that's the first generation. The second generation is even more contentious. That's when we can imagine at least that some of the decision making made by human beings and particularly by judges might be taken on by some form of artificial intelligence. Now, I don't want to overstate this. I don't want to say it's imminent, but it did seem to me it's a possibility worth debating and discussing. And I give an illustration of how this might work out. So in the book, you propose a way that this, that introducing online courts might begin. Can you talk a little bit about the, the, the stakes of uh, disputes that might be subject to online courts at the beginning and, and what kinds of disputes they would be? I anticipate in the first instance that the best suited cases for online treatment will be relatively low value civil disputes, perhaps some family disputes, some government or tribunal disputes as we call them in the UK. I'm not suggesting yet, but I think the day will come that we jump in and use these techniques to resolve major commercial disputes or issues that raise fundamental questions of public policy or social controversy. I'm suggesting that the lion's share of lower court work, which is dealing with relatively low value everyday issues, might be dealt with differently. And then from the experience any jurisdiction might might have using online courts for such uh, disputes, those jurisdictions could move on to such additional uses of online courts as might be warranted. I think that's right. And consistent with what we've seen in the whole discipline of disruptive technologies, what we generally see is that these technologies take hold, as it were, at the lower end of the market. And once they're in play, people ask the question, well, why couldn't we use them here, there and everywhere? I think it's important when you're introducing new technologies not to be too ambitious. So both as a matter of social necessity and as a matter of good technological practice, I say we start at this, and I put it in inverted commas, lower end of the market. And I say this in inverted commas because, of course, even low value disputes for individual citizens can actually be fundamental to their lives. That's right. And as you talk about, and that's a very important idea, these the stakes to the individual are high, even if the dollar amounts or the sterling amounts aren't, aren't so high. And you talk in, in your book about uh, keeping things proportional, uh, expending resources uh, in a way that makes sense in light of what the economic stakes of the matter are, uh, which is an important part of this. So you're, you're talking about introducing online courts in a way that will be gradual. But on the other hand, introducing online courts at all is quite a radical idea. Uh, having a, a courts that don't have bricks and mortar, uh, that, where everything is, is uh, virtual or is online. What's the case for making such a radical change in the way we organize our courts? I think, as I worry, the case is quite compelling. According to the OECD, only 46% of people on planet Earth live under the protection of the law. That's only 46% of realistic access to lawyers and courts. In some jurisdictions, the backlogs are staggering. If you take Brazil, for example, they have 100 million cases in their court system, 30 million in India. But even in advanced jurisdictions, and I'll pick our own in England and Wales, and we're proud of our system, the reality is that resolving disputes, particularly as I'm discussing low value disputes, takes too long, costs too much, is a highly combative process, it's unintelligible to anyone but lawyers and somehow seems out of t step in a digital society. Seems compelling to me. In fact, you say in the book uh, that when you really think about it, it's self-evident that we need fundamental change. This is one of the ways that we can see that law has not kept pace with changes in the world that most businesses uh, and even other professions have embraced. Well, I want to drill down now on some of the specifics you've just mentioned. 
So one issue that's implicated by what you have said is something we've come to think of as access to justice. And I think most of the time when people think about access to justice, they're thinking about the ability of people, and as you say, the majority of people in the world really don't have access to justice. And even in the United States and in England and Wales, it is true. But when most people think about it, they think about finding their way to a courthouse and getting into litigation. In your book, you expand on the idea and you come to what's really, what really is required to achieve access to justice. Could you talk a little more about that? Yes, and a little bit by way of background. When I was in Oxford, I was a tutor in jurisprudence and legal philosophy. So I have been immersed in the justice literature for many years and always been conscious that a lot of the discussions about justice according to the law and access to justice are rather shooting from the hip conversations as opposed to more rigorous studies. I wanted to bring a little bit of rigor to it. But secondly, what I was finding in relation to online courts was that people were invoking the concept of justice both to defend and to attack it. Some people were saying these kinds of technologies are an affront to justice, and others were saying this is the way we can increase access to justice. So at the very least, it seemed to be we needed a more systematic analysis of some of the concepts of justice. And one of the subdivisions that you're referring to was this idea that we should think beyond access to justice as about dispute resolution so that any, it seems to me, worthy justice system will not just provide the facilities for resolving disputes, but will also encourage disputes to be contained. I'm afraid that our current system, lawyers, judges, court procedures and so forth, are often more inclined to escalate rather than contain disputes. And this is rarely in the interests of those who are in war. And it has become war. It's become combat. And I say we need to contain the disputes. So as well as dispute resolution, access to justice should involve dispute containment. But I go even further than that. As I am often told when I'm speaking to, say, chief executives of businesses, They want to avoid problems in the first place. I describe this as wanting a fence at the top of the cliff rather than an ambulance at the bottom. And so it seems to me we should extend from dispute resolution and dispute containment to dispute avoidance as well. Right. And you have a fourth idea, which is in a perfect world, we achieve a system in which citizens and businesses are promoted to have legal health to think about their legal issues in their lives and their businesses in a way that are truly proactive and reduce the incidence of the need for law to begin with. Yes, I call this legal health promotion. I think most people think of the law as something that restricts or prohibits, but actually the law confers entitlements. It allows us to make wills. It allows you and I to enter into a contract with one another. It allows us to have security of employment. It seems to me that that's a vital justice-conferring role of law and society. So I I think this part of the book is truly provocative for all all of the people in, in the world who are working to increase access to justice. And most of the time, that's for those of low and moderate income, the ones that are, that are most vulnerable, don't have the resources to go through the conventional cost and so on of, of legal service. But I think these, these ideas really apply to everyone. Your discussion of dispute containment really is eye-opening. Uh, you point out that most judges and litigators discourage their friends and family from getting into litigation, which is true. And it is remarkable for us to contemplate. You also quote Learned Hand, who said that he dreads a lawsuit in his personal life for his family more than almost anything other than sickness and death. I'm glad you read that out rather than asking me if I could remember it. But yes, it is a wonderful quotation from, as I recall, 1926. But isn't it remarkable that very few lawyers would encourage their family or their friends to use the court system to resolve their disputes. It's a profound indication that the system's not fit for purpose. You're quite right, Richard. There are realities in the way our legal system works that we all take for granted. We live with those of us who do it every day. We live with. And then when you're confronted, as your quotations in the book uh, do confront us with that reality, it gives us pause. And it should. We can do better. One of the things that 
is most striking to me about your discussion of online courts is these are not just devices, or this would not be just a device, just a change, to make things go faster or to make them more cost effective. These are ideas that would make the system better. And when we get into the secondary part of access to justice and the idea of dispute containment, I think most people would regard that as a better system, still pursuing the objectives of the parties in a way that is fair and honest and all of that, but in a way that doesn't necessarily escalate in the way that our current system does. I think that's vital because many critics, perhaps not so much of online courts, but more of government investment in online courts, say that it's all about reducing costs. But that is really not my aim at all. I don't want to increase costs. But for me, it's about widening access and reducing the anguish that people go through in trying to understand and enforce their entitlements. Right. And, and that's absolutely clear in the book. It is so clear that that is so, that that's your thought, your objective. But it's also true more broadly about technology and the law. And people have the same concern often when you raise the use of technology in almost any setting to advance the way we deliver legal service, that that means somehow reducing quality, reducing care, reducing concern for the interests of the parties. And it just isn't so. If anything, if we use technology most intelligently and we combine it with process design, we'll make things work better. So let's take a break here uh, for a word from our sponsors and we'll be back. Hey, law firms, getting paid is fantastic, but dealing with accounts receivable is such a pain. What if there was a better way? Enter Headnote, an industry-leading compliant e-payments and AR automation system. Their unique blend of features cuts through the noise and helps you get paid 70% faster. Skip the paper checks, spreadsheets, and awkward calls due to overdue clients. Get paid faster with less effort. Visit headnote.com for more information. Okay, we're back, and we're here with Richard Suskind talking about his new book, Online Courts and the Future of Justice. Before the break, we were talking about uh, some of the ways in which the changes could make our court system work even better in an online setting. And I wanted to turn to something else you observed in the book. You, you distinguished alternative ways we might incorporate technology. On the one hand, we might do it uh, gradually, some, a little here and a little, a little there to improve the way the courts work. On the other hand, we might do something that is transformational, going all the way to online courts, at least for some disputes in some settings. And would you talk a little bit about uh, why you advocate transformational change? We've had several decades of grafting technology onto current systems, and that's given us essentially mess for less. The system itself is a bit messy, and you take some of the cost out by using technology. The dilemma, though, that leads me to suggest transformation has another dimension, and that is that I often say it's hard to change the wheel in a moving car. The reality is if you're running a court service, you can't stop for a couple of years, introduce new systems, and start up again. And we find this in the commercial private sector too. How do you bring about fundamental change and yet keep the business running? And my answer, metaphorically speaking, is you've got to start a new car, an entirely new entity, and that attracts some business, some activity at a lower level in the early stages, but over time more and more work, as it were, is transferred from the old vehicle to the new vehicle. And so I think to allow yourself not simply to graft technology on but rather to build a system from the ground up on the one hand and also to enable you to keep the existing system up and running, it makes sense to start afresh. And I think what you can anticipate is what I call incremental transformation because you won't have an overnight big bang change. But over time, as I say, I think we'll see more and more work gravitating towards this new model. Right. Incremental in the sense that in a given jurisdiction, the policymakers could identify some dimensions of the disputes that their system addresses or permits people to address and put those online with rules they design for the objectives they're trying to achieve, see how it works and go from there while leaving the other disputes to be resolved through the traditional system. Couldn't have put it better myself. (laughs) I should be interviewing you. (laughs) So I want to just drill down a little bit more on technology. 
one of the, I think, uh, illuminating parts of the book is your discussion of how far technology has come in its capacity to contribute in the way that an online uh, dispute resolution system would require. Can you talk a little bit about the, the you, you, aden- you distill four dimensions? Mm. It's interesting when you're living in a time of more rapid, more profound technological progress and change than humanity has ever witnessed, it doesn't actually feel revolutionary. But be in no doubt, almost every day you hear of a new app system technology breakthrough. So we are living in a time where I often say there's no finishing line. But the four dimensions you refer to, one is this explosive exponential growth in the underpinning technologies, whether or not you're talking about processing power, the amount of data, hard disk capacity, memory, bandwidth, the strides being made under each of these headings are mind-boggling. And then there's the second factor I describe where, and this is really a key feature of the book I wrote with my son Daniel on the professions, where we see our machines are becoming increasingly capable. And that, as human beings, is something we have to come to terms with, cohabiting with increasingly capable systems, machines that can take on tasks increasingly at a higher level than human lawyers, for example, document review and litigation. Since 2011, we've known in terms of precision and recall that these systems can outperform junior lawyers and paralegals. And they're the worst they're ever going to be from now on. These systems are just going in one direction. We're also finding these systems are increasingly pervasive. And I don't just mean the handhelds and the tablets that dominate our lives, but also the Internet of Things, the idea of chips embedded in everyday objects communicating with one another, chips already and will increasingly be embedded in human beings. And finally, we as human beings are becoming increasingly connected with new ways of collaborating, cooperating, and working with one another from telepresence through to social media. The way in which we live, socialize, and work is being transformed. And I say it seems entirely improbable and certainly undesirable that somehow the law and the court should be immune from these changes. So... Again, th- this set of observations is the kind of subject with which we're all familiar, but taking stock of it and what it means in all the ways you just detailed, inclu- including specifically the increasing capability of the technology to do things that previously required uh, humans and to do them better. Well, I don't think we can overstate this. It isn't always better and you have to code it right and get everything right but it it has the capacity to be better, means that the technology now makes possible some ideas about how we might organize a system of justice that weren't possible not very long ago. And as you say, it's only going to get better in the sense of its uh, capability over time. A simple and a complex example. Online courts, the first generation, online judging and the extended courts, simply would not have been possible before the early 90s when the World Wide Web was invented, full stop. Looking at more advanced applications, the idea of systems that can predict the outcome of court behavior more accurately than lawyers and judges, that again would not have happened without advances. We're seeing recent advances in AI and machine learning. And so the technologies here are not simply, as I keep on saying, automated past practice, these technologies are allowing us to deliver services in entirely new ways. So time won't permit us to get into all of the details uh, of this book, uh, but I encourage everyone who is listening to read the book. I think you will find extraordinary value on a lot of fronts, many of which are not at all about technology. Uh, The discussion in this book of rule of law and what that means is truly illuminating. It was for me, and I've thought about this since I was a first-year law student long ago. The discussion of what constitutes justice under the law is also powerful. And the more each of us who is involved in legal service, either as clients and and participants uh, or as lawyers or others dispensing legal service or those who are educating lawyers or regulating lawyers, thinks about these issues, the better off we will be. So, Richard, let me close with this. You've written this book uh, for anyone who wants to read it. Everyone in the world is touched by law, whether they know it or not. 
what can people, what can the people who are listening today and the readers of your book do uh, in response to what you have written? Very much depends where in the world they're located. I think in some areas of the world where the rule of law is sparse and courts are very, very rarely invoked and little to be trusted, I'm suggesting we maybe think about a global initiative to have the more widespread introduction of online courts as a way of getting us from this 46% of people who have protection under the law to a far greater number. But even in advanced jurisdictions, I think people have to be actively involved in bringing about changes. We are, and it's a cliche, of course, as lawyers and judges, we are a conservative bunch. But it does seem to me that we often are preoccupied with process, with the way we work, rather than with outcomes, the service we delivered. And so what I'm trying to encourage within advanced jurisdictions is an outcome-focused approach to thinking about the future of courts. I often say of neurosurgeons, that people don't want neurosurgeons, they want health. I think it's true of courts. People don't want physical courtrooms and lawyers and judges and traditional process. There are a whole bundle of things they want, but they want the end of their dispute. And I think this is going to require a social movement to bring about the kind of change that's necessary. And what's at stake is so incredibly important that we increase access to justice for all. Well, thank you, Richard. Thank you for joining us and spending this time talking about your new book. To all of our listeners, I I want to say that um, I was truly moved by this book. Richard is synonymous with um, technology and the law, and often we focus uh, on the technology, the science of it. But it really, at the end of the day, is about the people of it, the people who are served by the system. Early in the book, I'm going to quote here, Richard says, My case, therefore, is largely a moral case based on what I believe to be right and good. And then he says, all human beings should be accorded equal respect and dignity in context, meaning under the law. That's what this book and these ideas really are about. This program is about how the law works and how we can make it work better for everyone. And Richard, I can't think of a better discussion we could have about how we can make it work better for everyone than the one we have just had. Thank you for joining us. It's been my very great pleasure. Thank you, Rolf. And thank all of you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please uh, review this episode on Spotify or Apple or wherever you access your podcasts. And until next time, this is Ralph Baxter for Law Technology Now. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Thank you.